this is also something I always say to startups. Don't be too determined setting specific goals, but rather look at the growth. It's hard to say, I want this number three months from now, because it's so hard to say, you don't even know what you're building, but keep looking at the growth every single week, every single day. That's much more useful in the beginning. Hey everyone, this is Heine Sakharajan here and welcome to Founders Weekly, where we cover the news for startup founders and tell stories we can learn from. Today, we are talking crazy startup ideas and yes, it will involve an airline for dogs. We are also gonna dig deep into one of the biggest fundraisers in AI and one of the biggest fundraisers in Europe. My co-host today is Hassan Bassi. He's a founder, a developer, and a friend. Welcome, Hassan. Hello, good to be back, Heine. Great to have you. And last time you were on the East Coast, I do recall that. Where are you now? Uh, so today I'm in South Lebanon. So uh, I'm, I'm visiting home a little wow. bit. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to let a little war zone stop us from doing, uh, doing the podcast, right? We need to do the podcast wherever we are in the world. Okay. Absolutely. Let's stay safe out there. Let's go straight to our big story. British AI startup Wave raises $1 billion in their C round. And this is a fascinating story with all kinds of different perspectives. We are going to dive deep in, we're going to dive deep into this one. It's a very unique startup that could be a game changer in different ways. So first, let's have a look at the fundraise. It is their C round and the investment was led by SoftBank, Microsoft and Nvidia. So I'm not a huge fan of SoftBank. But what about the other two, NVIDIA and Microsoft? What do you think is on? I mean, uh, the, these are the two uh, to have, right? Uh, if you're any form of AI company and, uh, they, they, you know, they, they are an AI company. We'll, we'll touch a lot more on that uh, later. So you yeah. definitely want uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft backing you. What's interesting, though, once again, Microsoft is there investing yeah. in all the rising stars. It's been a thing since we started the podcast, basically. And, and what are they doing here? Are they making sure that if this becomes really big, they want to be a part of it? Or are there other reasons why they're, are they just, it could also just be making money, right? Like take an acquisition of GitHub, for example, they had a big strategic thing. They want to buy them and, and do something really big with them. What are they doing here? Uh, well, a lot of these AI companies, I would say when Microsoft comes in, it's a lot less about the money really. And again, it's about the compute. It's about the data centers. It's being able to, call up Sadia and say, hey, yeah. uh, things are going crazy right now. We're going to need more compute. Can we use a little bit more of this data center somewhere? And, and them being having that kind of connection. So I really think this is all about compute. Uh, and that's why you want Microsoft oh. there. And, and we're talking a billion dollars and a, a, like a C round builder, which is quite a lot. I know you always talk about compute, but there are other, we'll get deeper into the product in a second, but do they really need a billion here? I mean, they, let's see. Well, we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about their competitors later. But one of their competitors yeah. that is not doing too well right now raised $4 billion and oh. not that long ago either. So uh, you need a lot of money in this space. And, and where's the money? Is it compute or are there other things too? For the most part, it's compute. I mean, some of it's going to go into, you know, the classic going out there and going to market and yada, yada, and headcount, et cetera, but it really goes into compute. I mean, what other companies are raising that much money? And very early on, you know, we're talking, what is this, a, a C round, I think? C round, exactly. Yeah, they raised, we're up, we're up to 1.3 billion right now, totally raised. Yeah, that's insane. And, and that's a C round. That is wild. Yeah. <laughs> that is for really European, wild. For a European startup to <laughs> Exactly, rare. exactly. Last yeah. company I was at, they raised a C round. I think we raised 20 million, so. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> that's, common, 20, 30 million. It's, it's a lot really different. Well. Not a billion. Yeah, yes. exactly. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the company. Wave was founded in 2017 by Alex Kendall and Amar Shah. Alex is the current CEO. His journey began with award-winning research at the University of Cambridge, where he explored computer vision and robotics. His passion for autonomous vehicles led him to co-found Wave in 2017. Amar's expertise lies in machine learning and robotics. So. Definitely, uh, Hazan, these guys have pretty relevant backgrounds, huh? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's the background you want, right? Uh, what's interesting to me is the robotics aspect of it. Uh, we're we're going to yeah. talk again. I keep saying we're going to talk about stuff, but I mean, we're, we're <laughs> we doing it. We will talk about the product. 
we, yeah. we are going to do it. Uh, I'm very excited about this product, but specifically yeah. the, the robotics a part of their experience really matters and uh, it's going to show because they, they're really yeah. pushing this embodied AI uh, thing, which is essentially teaching robots how to look at the world and how to interact and how to make decisions. University of Cambridge is involved here, I would say again. And uh, if we look back at DeepMind, one of the, the old leaders in AI, they also, some of the founders also had connections. Do you see uh, University of Cambridge as a leader here? They absolutely are. I think uh, Cambridge has been a super leader in the AI field and the essentially the computer field really in the UK. Uh, you have Oxford that kind of opted more on the health tech side of, side of things. They're doing a lot more stuff with, I don't know, let's say uh, therapy stuff or stuff that has to do with biological or biotech so all the different like big universities in, in the UK have, have nicely went into these verticals, I would say. And it's nice because a lot of amazing stuff's coming out of Cambridge, like you said. Super impressive. Okay, let's get to the fun part here. Let's talk about what they do. So Wave's core focus is on embodied AI, a paradigm shift in AI for self-driving vehicles. Unlike traditional rule-based systems, Wave's approach integrates advanced AI directly into cars and robots. They call this AV 2.0, and some people call it the ChatGPT moment of autonomous vehicles. I mean, those are humongous statements. Is it is it that big a shift here? What are we talking? I mean, all right, let's let's take it let's, back. Let's let's talk bit. about what it is. Let's let's stick. What is the old system way of doing? What's the new way of doing? Sure, sure. So, so the old system is pretty much how everyone else does it right now, which Cruise, is... Cruise, Waymo, all these guys. Everyone, right? Like you have 30, 40, 50 different systems, right? And you have all the, the sensors and this data are, are bringing stuff in. And then you have 30 or 40 different machine learning algorithms. And each one is doing one thing really, really well. Like one of them is just yeah. spotting a pedestrian. That's it. It's just like a giant computer vision model that takes in... Uh, camera data and it's like this is a pedestrian and then you and write then raise his hand to some big that's brain that's and says, I, exactly. I saw somebody i saw somebody and then you need to actually go in there and code and say well if i see somebody if they're two meters away eh, i'll take the risk let's just do it <laughs> you know if they're one meter away maybe i should slow down if they're closer than that then you know hit the brakes but it's still a person, it's still code that is being, like the decision-making itself, right, is still happening at a human coding level, let's just say. It's not happening at the AI level. Uh, obviously, there's good and bad for that. So, that. so that's one aspect, right? The other aspect, which is very interesting, is that they use, again, computer, like vision, uh, cameras, and radars. And there's only one other company that does that, and that got a lot of shit for it. And that was Tesla. Tesla switched from LiDAR and all of that. And they're like, you know what? The best thing is actually just the camera. And so they, they're doing something very similar there. Well, just to be clear, when they said the best thing, they meant we can't afford the LiDAR, so now we're going to do this, right? I don't know if it's like afford the LiDAR. Essentially, like it's, it's a back to basics thing. What's, what's interesting is that this company was doing just camera and radar before Tesla. I think Tesla did it like right like last year or something. Yeah. It's kind of a going to basics thing because Tesla sat down and said, hey, how do we drive cars? We just look around. Sure, like maybe we can get a little bit more with, with radar specifically like if, you're, if we can see things to, to the peripheral vision. But we're just looking around. We're able to mostly drive very safely. So why don't we just get really good at that? And that's what they're doing here. So they're kind of yeah. simplifying things quite a bit, dealing with a lot less data and being able to just take in exactly what you need and make decisions off of it. And what I heard the CEO say the other day was also that we're now seeing regular cars being released that have this hardware built in. So all we need are these things you just said, and some of the cars that release, they're being built with this. I mean, that's them also saying like, hey, you know, our costs are gonna be lower, but to be fair, they, they do offer a full sensor package, right? So you can go yeah. in and buy the full sensor package and then put the software on top of that. Um, now, I don't know if it's time to, to flip to this, but, but I wanted to bring this up. I do think they're gonna have a lot of challenges when it comes to can, actually can I, deploying sorry, this. Sorry, sorry, like before we do that, then let's not, can we let's talk not. about yeah. yeah, can we talk about what this system is different, right? So the difference here is the other system had multiple machine learning, and this is end-to-end. -end. This is like one brain, right? Is that is that what we're saying? So 
the main difference is that the decision making is fully AI. That was not the case beforehand, right? The, the, beforehand, you have a bunch of parameters, you make a decision. Here, it's literally, hey, we're essentially training a model, right? That's taking in hours and hours and hours and hours and of, of computer data, of sensor data. And just like ChatGPT, where you give it a sentence and based on, you know, petabytes of whatever data, it figures out the next word, this just figures out the next turn or the next decision yeah. or the next break. So that's what it is, which is a bit scary, I guess, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen videos of a drive and so on. It's, it's incredibly impressive, I must say. But I mean, that's the next thing. If I make a rule that says, if you're two uh, meters from a child, you need to uh, push the brakes. This system is not going to have that. This is going to think, oh, there's a child. Yeah, I probably need to slow down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean this, it, it's as good as its data, right? It's, it's kind of like you're doing a chat GPT. And if, yeah, if you feed it a whole bunch of, I don't know, Nazi stuff, then it's just going to be pro-Nazi and that's it. So yeah. you've got to le like, just feed it a whole lot of useful data and a whole lot of different data. Tesla right now is, is not like struggling with this, but I remember Elon tweeted something like one out of 10,000th of the data we get back from full, uh, full self-driving from Tesla is useful. Not because it's bad data, but just because most of the data is just people driving in a straight line. <laughs> Which is, yeah. How are you going to, to make the AI better with that? You, you can't. Yeah, no. So you had a point before I interrupted you. Sorry, what was that? Actually, actually this is perfect transition, right? Like my point is, where are they going to get the data from? Tesla's doing it because they have, they are the number one auto manufacturer in the world right now. They already gave FSD to everyone or whatever a month ago, right? And that was just yeah. so they can get data. They weren't being nice, you know? <laughs> Apparently next, as soon as next week, they're releasing it so that you don't have to like touch the wheel every whatever, uh, okay. five minutes or whatever yeah. it is. I mean, that's huge, right? So yeah. now they're going to, again, their point is we want to try to get as much raw data. We don't want any human intervention. We don't want anything. We want to see how our AI is doing in the real world so we can make it better. Where is Wave going to get their data from? I mean, they yeah. don't really have any big commercial deals yet, as far as I understand. No, but they need to do partnerships, right? They need to do partnerships with people that build cars and put them in there. Because that's the, the second thing I want to touch on here is also they're not going to build a car. They are testing but they're not going to build a car, uh, which I think is great because then you can really focus on the software. I think, you know, you have one challenge that is humongous as a startup. Do you really need another one actually building a car, which is incredibly complex? So I think that's the right decision. Absolutely. I, I love this. Uh, you know how much I love this. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it a business model, product model in general, right? Yeah. Take a really big industry, take something small, make it really, 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 really good. I mean... Yeah. It's, it's the best way to go, especially if you're doing it with software, because then you don't have to yeah. build a giant factory in China somewhere. Exactly. So, so the one other thing I want to touch about on the product and data, you keep saying where they're going to get the data and so on. It's important to say that they don't need as much data. They need data for training, but they're not going to build HD maps like the other guys do. So the model for Cruise and Waymo is they're going to build this insane maps and they're yeah. very detailed, and then they're going to build drive within that. That's not the idea here. The idea here is to train a brain that figures that out just like a human, just better. Exactly. Again, I, I just, I don't know. It, it's not me that's going to make that decision. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, no. Ford and GM and like, you're going to go to them and say, hey, uh, I have this model. It, it's amazing. It's great. We've trained it on whatever, like a few thousand hours of, of someone driving. And we've driven it around the UK for, I think like they've been driving it for something like two years now, which is very yeah. impressive. But yeah. how many hours is that? And I don't know, as, as yeah. how does GM make that decision and just say, okay, cool, yeah, we trust this, let's try it. The thing is here also, they could also just be building a much better self-driving, meaning uh, let's take it in stages where we don't go like totally driverless, no steering wheel at all, just, just do this better. And that could be step one and then get a shitload of data by with a partnership with Honda or somebody. It could be something right, like that. Right, right. I would and love for them to work. just install these whatever systems in cars, especially if it's just a software play, like maybe they can, you know, convince GM, hey, all we want to do is we want to pretend to make the decisions. We're not going to do anything. And we're just going to compare it to what the real human actually did. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that would be amazing exactly. for that them, actually. Be. That's, that's yeah, yeah. super powerful. But again, you need someone to, to do that with them. And it's probably going to come at a cost of some sort of 
investment or exclusive partnership or something. Although I know that their whole point is they want to stay away from it and they market it yeah. that way, right? Like we can sell to all of the car manufacturers. We don't need to just like have one. So no. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, I believe in this company. I think this is the way forward, not trying to make rules for 10,000 things. It just got too complex and sort of for obvious reason, like we can't do it like this. I think this might be the way forward exactly when that's hard to say, but I think this might be the way forward. I must say. I fully agree. I, I think so too. Again, find a problem in a giant field, do something amazing and go all in on it. And then we think it's incredible. I think it's incredible. They raised a billion dollars. It's, it's a UK based company. They really have, the, and they have the right partners and the money to make this. And I, I watched a couple of interviews with, with the founder incredibly thoughtful guy, super impressed by, by this all around, I must say. Oh yeah. I mean, they had, I think Bill Gates a year ago, they'd like put the system on some super simple car. I don't know what it was like some Toyota or a Honda or something. And Bill Gates yeah. was just like shocked, you know, how, how well yeah, it was It is doing. amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. So okay. It's great. With that, we're going to take a short break. And this is one of the wild ideas in startup. This one is, is this is a big one. We're going to do self-driving in a different way and we're going to raise a billion dollars for it. Yeah, we're impressed. When we come back, we're going to talk about another wild idea within startups. And it is somewhat related to, shall we say, dogs on airplanes. So stay tuned. Okay, we are back. Today's guest is Henrik Werdlin. Henrik is the co-founder of Bark, formerly known as Bark Box as well as a founding partner of Prehype, a venture development firm headquartered in New York. Henrik, welcome. Thank you. So I invited you on to talk about a specific thing, one of your latest ventures. And I think that is related to a, you know, let's say a pretty wild idea. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about BarkBox. Uh, what is it? How did that come about? And so on. Because is it a tech company? Is it a Animal company, what the heck is it? I think that's a good question. We started BarkBox in 2011. And I think at the time it wasn't really meant to be a kind of a big idea. It was basically my co-founders and I had started a few companies before and were kind of big on this idea of just building a profitable business. And so- uh, It's about time. Matt, Matt <laughs> uh, my co-founder at the time, uh, the co-founder had a, had a great Dane at the time that didn't really had a lot of cool stuff to play with. And so uh, we basically thought maybe we can do one of these boxes with cool uh, stuff that we can put in. So that's the basic idea. The first uh, <clears throat> the first business was just a box with two treats, two toys, and a chew. Um, and then since then, we moved on to uh, anything from dental products to food to uh, airlines. Wow. It's a full selection for basically for dogs, I would assume, right? And the, that went really well. And you SPAC or IPO the business in 2019, 2020. When did you do that? Yeah, 21, we took it public at New York Stock Exchange. Fantastic. Well done. It's incredible. Like we talked about being focused and doing one thing well. And I guess you did that pretty damn well. Appreciate it. I mean, it makes it easier <laughs> when you, uh, it's all about making dogs happy. Yeah, exactly. That is, that's always a good thing. So, well, that, that's where we get to the next thing, right? That's also about making dogs happy. So. I saw this promotional thing for Bark Air. And first thing I do is look at the date. Is it April 1st? What is it? And <laughs> I literally sort of double checked, is this real or what? But, but tell us what, what Bark Air is. Well, Bark Air is an airline for dogs where we uh, try to solve the problem that a lot of us with big dogs have, which is basically if you want to go anywhere where you have to fly, uh, the only option you have is really to put it down in the cargo bay. And that is obviously a huge... I have small dogs for that particular reason. Let's let's put it that way because it's painful. We moved to the US, we had to put in a cargo bay. That is that's no fun at all. So so tell us what you've you what you've built. Well, so we built a first class airline where we allow uh, dogs to buy a first class ticket to currently fly either New York, LA or New York, London. And then they can invite their human with them. And then we try to create an experience design that is really optimized for if a dog was to fly first class, what would it do and what would it enjoy? So anything from squirrel in-flight entertainment uh, videos <laughs> to non-alcoholic champagne made of chicken broth to, uh, you know, like whatever you can think of. And so it's been a a full kind of like journey down the rabbit hole of if you were to design an experience from scratch for a dog's perspective, how would you do? I'm thinking you guys had a lot of fun in front of the whiteboard here. I mean, like 
This is honestly an idea that's been brewing around for a long time. I mean, like, we've always seen Bark as being in the business of making dogs and their people happy, not as being a stuff in a box business. And so the mental model for all us have always been Disney for dogs. And Disney, we find inspiring because it's tough to kind of figure out if it's a media company or if it's a park company or if it's a products company, it's a little bit of everything. And so in the same thing, we always thought ourselves like that. Um, and so the idea of having services and experiences that we would like to sell to our customers, something that we've had for a long time. And so this is one of those ideas that's been brewing pretty much from the beginning of the company. I, I really love that you stuck to the, the tone of voice too right now, even when we asked, because I don't know, Heine, if you've seen the FAQ page, like that's the first thing I looked I at. I saw it. I saw it. Yeah, oh yeah. my, it's, it's, if anyone is listening, watching, just go check out that FAQ page. Like it's just, it's, it's really like <laughs> dogs are just first class citizens, you know, and humans are like second class, you know, yeah, yeah. You can bring your human if you want, whatever they can come. <laughs> like <to>. it's, <laughs> I you know what else, I, I think that's interesting that and that's something we've done, even if you sign a contract with us, like if you get a job, a job contract, we have like small, I would say like not jokes, but we, we write like that all the way through down to our contracts. And so I do think when you're building something in order for you to communicate just how insane you are about trying to make dogs happy, as happy as they make you, you have to kind of do it everywhere. Right. And so. Even like our finance team, I saw like a deck the other day where you, it says something like it was like the, you know, whatever budgets. And then there was a little asterisk in the years. And I was like, I wonder what that is. And so I went down to the notes and the asterisk was something to the extent of like, note, this is in human years, not in dog years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's cool. Even your termination is, is like one year, which is actually one eighth of a year. But um, yes. So in practical terms, do you fly every week now? And I think you fly Gulfstream. So smaller airplanes at, at a high cost. And I totally get that. You got to start somewhere. Tell us a little bit about the practical operation at this point. Yeah. So I so think the ambition is to do a little bit like Tesla did. You kind of like, you, yeah. in order to get to the sedan, you have to start with the high luxury sports car. Just like Uber did too. And same thing with Uber with the black cars, right? And so I, I think we very much have leaned into that way of thinking. We have designed basically this 747 version with these uh, suites that we would like to go to in the not too distant future. And so until the, we get that kind of thing done, uh, we're flying Gulf Streams. And a lot of the experience is really about how do you make sure that the dog kind of gets like a good flight, uh, more than necessarily that the flight specifically is done for the for the dog. But of course, like anything from blankets to, you know, like the hormones to make them relax to whatever, like, you know, we have in the plane is designed for the dog, but the dog, the, the, the current planes are, are, are call streams. I saw some picture of it. It looks amazing. So I want you to check out the website too, to see what the experience actually looks like. How often do you fly now? We fly once a week right now. I think it's once a week. Maybe it's something like that. You know, obviously we're not, you know, we haven't been doing it more than a few weeks now. So, uh, so we're just getting started and we're trying to understand how much demand is there and, and how much can we fly? One of the things that we were adamant on was to have a pretty regular schedule because we would like people to be able to, for example, go to New York from LA or New York from London with their dog. And the problem had been uh, in the past that you might even be able to hitch a ride with, you know, another service that does private uh, air travel, but then you didn't know when you can come back. Uh, and so, we're trying to be a little bit kind of consistent with it so that you can bring your dog to with you to work if if you have to go for a few weeks to New York, for example. So there's a predictable way of, of uh, sort of getting back. Amazing. So can we ask like, how is it going? I know it's early, but is it, are you full or are you half? What's happening right now? Yeah. I mean, like a lot, you know, I don't, you know, I don't follow kind of like every plane uh, that much, but <laughs> I, I think we were, I mean, like we wanted to do this for a long time. And so it's one of those things where we just have to do it. Yeah. And you have I the users too, like the, the, the people you have in your database, they love dogs, right? They love dogs. And, you know, honestly, you know, we were, you know, we're, you know, public listed company, we're try, you know, we're frugal, we're profitable. And so you know, <clears throat> we also don't want to do anything that doesn't allow us to keep things going for a long run time. So we were obviously like sensitive to like, is this um, something that, we were pretty certain 
that we would get a lot of attention uh, around it. And so I think for that, we could probably justify some of the investment, but you know, for it to, to work, it has to work for the long run. And so I guess the short version is that we've been kind of blown away by the take up of it. Like we've sold up, sold out most of the planes, as far as I know, like of the one that's kind of coming up. Um, and then we're just adding them on the back of it. And so wow. I honestly think it's going, like consider it's a very expensive ticket, right? Like it's $6,000 one way in the US and it's $8,000 to that. Like it's an obscene amount of money for most people. But I mean, like the second we put it online, we had not only a lot of people who called and asked if they could travel with the dogs, but we have people who called and asked if they could travel with their pet pigs, uh, with their different types <laughs> of birds. You know, at this point, we, uh, we're doing the dogs only. Long version of saying it's been going better than we could ever had hoped. Amazing. So we touched on this before, but I do think you guys are, your marketing is what you guys do well. And I just heard this story about the CEO going on a special journey. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Henry? Yeah, I mean, like, if you want to invoke a little bit of pain or misery to your co-founder, then uh, <laughs> and the you most do want ideal that once thing you can think of is to put this person in a crate, dog crate, kennel, and then fly him for four hours to uh, from Miami to uh, New York, uh, which is what we did. This was like an idea that it, when first it was brought up, you know, obviously everybody was like, this is the funniest thing ever. <laughs> and so... Matt, uh, my co-founder and the CEO of the company, got put in a crate and got put in the cargo hold. And then we, fortunately, we, we couldn't actually fly him because that was illegal. And so we had to kind of close the cargo bays. And, you know, I think we drove the plane around for a bit just to kind of like give the the feeling of, uh, of I how bet it was. That was so, enough. And, but I think he spent like a long time there. I want to say he spent like hours and hours in there. And at the last point, he was like, you know, Matt has been obsessed about this idea for a long run, but at the end of like having been the crate for that long, he was like, okay, this is the only thing we have to do now. This has to work because there's no way we, we can't come up with a good, better way of getting dogs kind of from, from coast to coast. Amazing. That really motivated him, right? I mean, I definitely did. And it was very enjoyable for the rest of us. Of yeah, course, exactly. of course. <laughs> I think I think it's it's interesting because it also just invokes like so many feelings uh, and within dog owners, just dog lovers. Like I don't necessarily have a dog, but I immediately was like, oh my god, I'm never like if I do have a dog, I'm never sending them in a crate ever again. It just I had never thought about it before too. So it's rough. Yeah, I mean, like I have been I've been on many planes, you know, because obviously I go back and forth from Europe to the US quite a lot. I'd say no less than five times have I been on a plane where you could hear the dog whining all the way across. Like this oh, is eight funny. hours of just sitting there and hearing a dog that does not enjoy it. And so, I mean, like it's pretty insane that the travel industry hasn't come up with a better way of doing it. Totally. But so it I, is right I, now because you're leading it. I have a super quick uh, question, actually. I mean, we kind of already answered it, but not really. So if when, when you're launching something like this, I mean, you said how, okay, this is something that has to work, right? But what did you guys have in mind like before you launched? What was going to be the thing where you're like, okay, if, if we don't reach a certain level within a certain time, then we're cutting this. Did you have like numbers like this or was it more like we're just going to, you know, figure it out as we go? I mean, I'm sure like we have a very, very sensible CFO that keeps us very honest uh, a lot and this. uh a, a very good counterbalance to to Matt and I, but I, I think the reality is that some of these things are probably only doable in a founder led company because you have to have a little bit of a leap of faith, right? And it wasn't because there wasn't a lot of people who was kind of like saying that this was a bad idea, but you know, and why would we do that? And but I really think you know it's one of those I think seductive and very viral ideas, even like when you just talk about it, you know, when somebody come in saying, Hey, we're doing a first class or plane for dogs. And you work in a company that's filled with people who are dog lovers. I mean, like most people are like, okay, this sounds crazy. And I think from a brand perspective and what, what Heine was saying is that I think one of the things that made us kind of keep going and, and kind of made us both big, but also compete well against others is that we have a little bit of that audacity. We have, we have a perspective. We dare doing a few things that other people don't dare. And we are kind of insanely obsessive about, you know, like just making dogs happy. 
And so, and I think not just making them happy, but also create like, as Disney probably would think of like make magic for them, right? Yeah, it was definitely an idea that uh, had to get a little bit of like the push. But uh, I think once we got the snowball a little bit formed, like it started to roll pretty fast. Awesome, incredible. Okay, we're going to talk a few questions and we'll talk about the podcast. Okay, we are back. So the first question I have here is, is it important when you build a startup to have a contrarian idea? Does it have to be like a contrarian idea? This one definitely is, and some of them are, but does it have to be? I don't think they have to be a contrarian. When we started BarkBox, I think the idea in itself was pretty obvious and not kind of like adventurous. I think we probably had a contrarian way of executing it. You know, we, no. I came from the background of MTV where MTV was never about the utility of playing music, right? It wasn't how do you go to a concert or five ways to play a guitar. It was about having music at heart and, you know, being about rock and roll. I think Bark has always been the same thing. It's been about the lifestyle of having a dog. So I don't think you have to have a contrarian idea, but I think you, specifically in, in today's age with so much noise on the interweb, you have to have a perspective and you have to have something that people can emotionally connect to. What is Yazan? Uh, I, I love I love the term you just used, con contrarian execution. Uh, really, like I'm a huge, huge fan of doing things much different and, and, and a very like invoking empathy within customers because a lot of people don't. Like there are so many companies out there that you go and you say, oh, you know, someone else did it. Why would I do it? Someone else did it. Why would I do it? But it would be so surprising if you just add a little bit of quality, a little bit of empathy to customers, how far you can go and uh, clearly, that's what Henrik and, and his team did. So, And one thing, if I may just add to it, because I'm kind of obsessing about this right now, I have this new thesis that we talk a lot about, we call relationship capital, which is really about in a world where AI allow everybody to be pretty competitive on a lot of pieces of the stack, like they can render imagery real fast, they can write copy real fast, they can compete right, in SEO. Yeah. I think one of the things that we have to be very mindful of as entrepreneurs is how do we create that last mile relationship? How do we predict what products and services the customers want so that we have them ready before they might even have shown intent? And how do we have then a connection? So if we're offering it to them, they're buying it from us instead of somebody else. I mean, that could also j just be, that could be brand, right? So all these things, people can do this, but with this brand, you can do it better or in a different way, right? hundred percent. Okay. So I'm going to stay a little bit with that. And we, I feel like we almost answered this question, but I'm still going to go there. Is it easier or harder to get a get funding with a contrarian idea, right? So we talked a little bit about it. So so let's take Bark here as an example right away. Would would it even be possible to for this to be a venture funded thing? <laughs> I don't know. I hate That's to be the one question. right now. In the, <laughs> I hate to be the one in the current market that goes out and make that pitch. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> That's a rough. I honestly think, and I mean, like you know, we've all kind of spoken to a lot of VCs in the world. And I think as the somebody who's still operating, you kind of like love to say uh, contrarian and slightly rude things about VCs. I do think less <laughs> about, it's less about the contrarian and I think it's more about the matchmaking. It is about finding, yeah. you know, is your idea so contrarian that you can't find the contrarian person on the other side? And I think a lot of VCs actually, you know, see themselves as pretty contrarian views, specifically some of the better ones. Like they, they try to sick when everybody sacks. And so, I don't think you have to, but I think you have to have something that for whatever reason emotionally connects with an investment manager somewhere. I, I agree. I think for me also, like the founder needs to be a, a contrarian founder. Like for me, that's the, that's the answer to that. If you're going to bring that kind of idea, is, is this the right like founder or founder team that's actually going to get it there, right? Because a lot of times people might have crazy ideas, but nowhere near, uh, I guess, like the founder relationship to actually execute on it. So. I think that's a hundred percent right. I, I think of it as kind of customer founder fit. Like you need to have something where that connection is very clear and very believable. Yeah. 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 There's a reason. Why are you doing this? There's a reason why you do this. And and before you came on, Henry, we talked about the, the British company Wave that just closed a billion dollar round. And that was a contrarian idea. Everyone was doing autonomous vehicles in a specific way. They came around in 2017 and said, we're going to do this differently. And they started, they had raised before this week, they had raised two, 300 million. And now they raised a billion dollar round on what at least a couple of years ago was very contrary. And now it's like, hmm, maybe that's the only way. Yeah. yeah. And I think if you look at some of the companies we all admire, like take Apple, right? I imagine 
being the one who walked into the boardroom and saying, we're making desktop computers, now we're going to make MP3 players, you know, or the Amazon going in and saying, you know, we're selling books, now we're going to do a cloud hosting service provider. I think even more impressive than the people who raised a bunch of money is the people who've shown like, you know, then 10 years later, that, that contrarian view is actually the yeah. thing that would kind of build them their ne next growth cycle. And we often, it, we often see it as being quite obvious when they did it, because of course, Amazon would do the AWS, but I can only imagine how complicated that pitch would have been at, at that time. Apparently, uh, Tesla is about to like have a giant pivot into like robo taxi. It's a very serious thing. Like complete focus on it. We'll see. We'll see. They promised August eighth. August eighth, they're going to launch a robo taxi. Why? Why August eighth? Is that like a? No, he, uh, he. They just tweeted oh, it. Oh, did they? Did they? they oh, I had tweeted. no idea. Okay. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it came out. I was going to do an episode that we didn't mention Elon Musk's name, and here we go. <laughs> but he tweeted a few weeks ago that eight eighth uh, robot taxi. That's the only thing that was in this in this tweet. Ah, I see, I see. I thought it was because it was ne next to my birthday, but <sighs> it could have been there for he picked it. You know, who knows? <laughs> Chances are high. Yeah, yeah who exactly. knows? <laughs> cool. And we are almost there. I'm gonna just give you a little bit. I have full transparency on this podcast. I know Henrik, you have a you're on a, a different podcast too. But I I share with all our our listeners, how it's going. And it's going well. Uh, I was traveling last week, so we had a little bit of issues with uploading the podcast. So it was a little bit late. So numbers are a little bit down, but I think that is fine. It, it took a day before uh, YouTube was uploaded. So, so numbers are a little bit down on, based on that. Other than that, subscribers keep going up, 8% up from last week. Uh, another cool thing I think is that, I know this is true for most podcasts, they have somewhat of a long tail. You know, we've had six, 700 people listen to the episode within a week, but we see now that over time, they actually get to a thousand. Uh, so, so I kind of like that we're getting to a point where we have a thousand people listening. This is episode number nine. So the next one will be 10. I sort of committed to doing 10 episodes on a journey to 10,000, not episodes, but listeners. We'll see about that. But uh, at least a thousand, I think is, is kind of cool. I must say, what do you guys think about that? You know what? One thing that I was thinking about the other day when I was looking at my own podcast numbers is that we also get so numbed with numbers. And like, if you took a thousand people and put them in a theater, it would be shitload of people. Oh. Like it would be an immense yeah. amount of people and, and you'd be overwhelmed by it. And so I think maybe it's, uh, it's also good sometimes just to be slightly humbled by how incredible it is that a thousand people can be bothered sitting and talking yeah. to some two people with a Danish uh, dialect and uh, <laughs> yeah. very smart things. But so I, I think, I mean, I think thousand people is incredible. I, I'm, I'm trying not to blind myself by hundreds of millions and stuff like that yeah, and, totally. and just be happy that somebody is showing up. Totally. I appreciate it. I love that. I love that perspective so much. And, and again, this is like the content you're creating out of this is also long tail, right? Like there's so much, yeah. you're going to see like the, the growth, the stuff we're talking about week after week. Imagine a year from now, just the amazing trove of content that we're going to, because you're doing this every single week. For me, that was exactly. the most impressive thing from the very first day. Every single week, <laughs> Heine's just working on this and he's a busy man. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Somewhere but, in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's awesome. And if not to talk about my co-host uh, and Henrik uh, Hassan is in southern Lebanon right now recording. So uh, we are definitely all over. Oh, yeah. Everywhere. But uh, I was yeah. going to ask you, Heine, actually. So, so you committed to 10. 10 is the next one. Yes. But I assume. We're, yeah, we're, I'm gonna we're going to keep going. I can't. Like, this is the thing. I just <laughs> yeah. when I do something, I just keep going. Right. So I'm definitely going to keep going. I enjoy it very much. I, I'd love to see bigger numbers. But I, this is also something I always say to startups. Don't be too determined setting specific goals, but rather look at the growth. That's what you need to look. Just keep saying, it's hard to say, I want this number three months from now, because it's so hard to say, you don't even know what you're building. But keep looking at the growth every single week, every single day. That's much more useful in the beginning. And the growth is doing great. I'll add one thing to that. I, um, I read this book the other day that I'm getting quite obsessed about called Why Greatness Can't Be Planned by Kenneth Stanley. He's a professor in, uh, in AI. I was a professor in, in Florida, uh, built a company, sold it to Uber, became head of AI at Uber, and then he went to OpenAI. And now he's doing a social network kind of thing. Anyway, he has this thesis that basically we can't grow, we can't make an object, growth an objective because then we'll never get there. What you have to do is create these, what he called open-endedness systems. And one of the ways that you kind of do that is by following what he refers to as interestingness. 
And if you as a founder with great intensity and a lot of energy and you know all the smarts and wits and all this stuff and luck pursue interestingness, then that would create like the stepping stones that would lead you to kind of like big growth numbers and, and uh, great discoveries. And for some reason, he, I mean, like this theory was about uh, artificial general intelligence, but I actually think for entrepreneurship, it's the first time somebody articulated something where I'm like, you know, that, that sounds right. You know, like that's, yeah, that seems like a cool way of doing it. And when it comes to leadership, I mean, that is so very true because I honestly, I can be motivated by numbers saying, look, we're going to grow hundred percent this year. It's amazing. But people come to Heine, that just isn't an idea. That's just a number. Tell us we're going to do something, change something. Mm -hmm. And that motivates people, right? So I think that's very much aligned with your chain. Perfect. We have come to the end. Please make sure you follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And please leave a review and rating if it, it really helps. For all of you on YouTube, please make sure you check out Raw Startup. A lot of good videos on how to build a startup. This has been Founders Weekly. Now stop listening and go build something.